different uh, continents, and that's of course great. Uh, my name is Lucas Ritzel. I am based in Switzerland, and um, I am uh, lecturing quite a lot uh, in different universities, online as well as offline. So it's a pleasure to represent the ABMS University today and talk a little bit about internet and net generation aspects of the internet. Um, understand this whole 90 minutes about as a kind of introduction to more technical issues that might follow later, where I will lecture eventually about uh, SEO, um, SEM, so search engine optimization, search engine marketing and uh, uh, advertisements, uh, when we talk about uh, things like um, crowdsourcing, when we talk about mobile, when we talk about different aspects of um, different channels uh, used mainly in business, in management or marketing from the internet. And the first slide I show here is a kind of symbolic start of the whole where we see a huge balloon and this balloon is actually a project from Google and Google wants to put those balloons all around the world in the air and it will enable free access to internet for just everyone. And that's of course a, a great thing. As we see now, we have people from many thousand kilometers away joining this classroom and this is of course only possible because of the internet. So giving access to the internet will change even more to the current uh, behavior and current possibilities and mindset of net generation, um, net generations already or net generations to come. And so today's presentation, I would like a little bit to talk about those different aspects. Why? And I guess you are a little bit younger than me. So you are part of net generation. You are a part of this generation that uh, grew up already with being on. And you are um, uh, actually just used to be on where in my uh, time, when I was at your age, when I was around 25, 30, um, to be on was still something pretty special. But before we start, just a little bit about myself. I said I'm from Switzerland, I'm married, um, I have one daughter, I am a kind of, my family is as well, a, a mix of everything. I live 10 years in Asia, so my wife is Asian, my daughter is half-half, so half Swiss, half Asian, and you can uh, download the whole presentations here. There will be two slides, um, slideshows that you can download and you can read about everything um, more that you are interested in. And so what will I tell you today a little bit? And um, I hope um, I can get you interested in telling you some of the questions that I try to answer. And um, this is a bit storytelling aspect, so it will not be a technical presentation. It will be more just sharing some of my um, stories that I have seen on the internet and made me think and perhaps make you think too. As well, don't expect really answers on everything. I mean, my role here is not really to educate you only and tell you how the world is. My role is more, uh, that's how I see it, to make you think and uh, develop your own um, questions and give yourself your the own answers or search for the answer. So what we talk about is a squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant to your interest right now than people dying in Africa. This is not a quote by me, but by Mark Zuckerberg, who you might know is the inventor or the boss of Facebook. Then we will look at Hall 9000 in 2016. Not sure if you know who is Hall. A Digital Goodbye by Major Tom as well here. We go a little bit back in time and I will tell you there a story. I will tell you about Filter Bubble versus a connection to the world, which is great for democracy and society in general. Um, the Filter Bubble was something um, coined by Eli Parisi and we will look at this. I'm a big fan of Metallica that just came out with a great new album. And uh, some, some years ago, it didn't went well with Metallica because they went to war with their fans and it has a lot to do with digital. Then a question, do you want to fly to Gotham or Metropolis? 
um, the nerds among you, there's the the comics fans around you might know Gotham and Metropolis are not really existing. They are the cities where uh, Batman is roaming and Superman. But still, there are ways you can visit today Gotham and Metropolis in real. We talk about companies that whisper through social media and I try to tell you a story about something that is very important for me currently because I am currently in a big project involved in the car industry and the sharing economy is a big problem for the car industry. Okay, moving on. And before we talk about the today's time, I want to get you a little bit in the mood how it was when I grew up. And um, you have to tell me, I will switch here to the YouTube. And one thing I'm not sure if I should um, switch off my sound that you hear it better. So please put in the chat, if the sound is okay, otherwise I will switch it off, the sound on my side, and you tell me then if it's better. Okay, enjoy. You might, might not, not remember, remember us, us, but we met in the 90s. We are members, members of Generation, Generation y, y, as in Yin Yang, Yo Yo. Life moved a little slower. Discs were square, desktop folders had personality. Extra storage space was just a zipper away. There is only one social network, but most of your friends died of dysentery. The only thing buzzing in your pocket was a pet. Until that died too. But at least the troll was still a friend. Lunch was a puzzle, not a picture. You were pumping jams, water, shoes. You didn't have to worry about a news feed full of farm animals. You were busy feeding wild animals. A haircut didn't cost $60. It cost four minutes. You really had nothing to lose. Unless, of course, you were playing for keeps. The future was bright. You grew up, so did we. Okay, going back to the audio and going back to the presentation. So this was a bit uh, insight in a very strange world, uh, which you might never have experienced, which was uh, before uh, the internet. And so, even if we use sometimes the same expressions, we meant something very different. But all together, uh, for the ones who are into marketing or into psychology, you might know that the whole basics of what we like, what we do, why we do things, has not changed. There was this guy, Maslow, who put down this pyramid of um, uh, needs where it starts with the psychological needs, the safety, the love, the belonging, the esteem to the self-actualization. And this, this hasn't changed. So there is no difference to those needs today. But still, things have changed. I told you before that my daughter Kira, she's now nine years old, and uh, she is, of course, the typical net generation kid. She, she will never um, imagine that there was a time where um, we would not just be online and could get answers on every question. And today, what we see here on the joke, she is actually telling me whenever I give her an answer, I don't know, she will say, why don't you ask the computer? Or she even uses the word Google. Why don't you Google it? So Google it becomes a kind of term to have the answers for everything. And certainly we will talk a little bit about this more close. How much actually happens on the internet? You see, um, I cannot push websites here. So when you download the presentation, you can um, click this link on the bottom and you will see it shows always what is going on on the internet in 20 seconds. 20 seconds is not a long time, but you will always see that they are really whole internet, not only Google, but YouTube, LinkedIn. Um, it's always active. 
and it's always fed by people or people ask the internet something or get into um, communication with each other or collaborate together so the internet becomes a common tool to be interactive if you look a little bit on what is special as well is that one of the world's most feared man is not a warlord is not a, a, a politician it's actually an IT nerd who hides somewhere in Russia. I guess uh, you know who I'm talking about. Or if we go further, there is a kind of new digital global police that everyone fears with anonymous who can't describe who they are actually, but they have really enormous power in doing and playing a kind of global police role. And being it on special people, individuals, or being it on special politicians or special um, groups of people, Anonymous is here and threatens them and does not only threatens them, but it's as well successful. So when they say they will um, have war against a special um, group of people, then normally those people are um, in trouble because they have digital power, which is today more than power through weapons or power through other um, channels. We just went through a American uh, voting where we uh, have become a new American president. Uh, we'll be seeing where that this leads us. But actually, it seems like there were some viral news which helped Trump to become president because Hillary Clinton in 2013 said, I would like to see people like Donald Trump run for office. They are honest and can't be bought. Now, the funny thing about that is not what she said. The funny thing is that it's totally fake. This news actually has not been done like this, but it became an engagement on Facebook with 507,000 people engaging with this posting and um, those people actually thought, obviously, um, that this is truth, that uh, Hillary really said that. But it's actually not right. And this fake news, which go viral and distort a little bit the opinion of people, is so important right now that uh, CNN and other big uh, TV channels are talking about it and say, how can we prevent it? And it certainly will be up to you um, out there to really handle all those information that you can get on the internet but you have to find out um, are they real this is not so easy another great internet story is this young guy andrew um, who is worth 680 million because he created a um, online game which is played all around the world and made this pretty young gent to one of the richest people on this planet. I told you already that um, uh, I'm right now involved in the car industry, consulting them into digital aspects, marketing aspects, and they told me that really um, a big problem is that the millennials, so the next generation, don't care too much about owning cars, and um, uh, car makers can't figure out why. Now, I think I could give a kind of answer because the sharing aspect of the internet, of course, plays a scale back to the people in their daily life. So we are in this sharing mode and same, why don't we share then as well cars, which is actually something clever if we look at what damage cars can do to the environment. Here a slide uh, from Switzerland. Um, it's about what was the top topics um, in 2015, if uh, concerning to Google, and um, one of the biggest topics was uh, obviously the refugees. So uh, the refugee crisis was one of the biggest topics. There were 23 plus million searches done on this topic. But this I understand, but it was beaten with plus 10 million. So from uh, 10 million, a third more. Uh, search requests are on Cecil. Now, who is Cecil? I don't know if you have 
heard that story. It was a doctor from the States who went to um, our colleagues from Africa might know that story, who went, I think, to South Africa or to a neighboring country, and he had a license to shoot a lion. He shot the lion, and this lion was, by bad luck, one of the symbols of uh, the country. So everyone loved this um, uh, lion, and um, they were so stupid to put that picture on the Facebook, and it started uh, what you call a shitstorm. So people were talking about it and swearing, why did you shoot this line and so on. And so it's kind of strange still that a death, a very unfortunate death of a nice lion, uh, reaches more searches than a really global crisis uh, around refugees. But this, I think, is something that as well plays the same role than why those fake news can play such a big role. Emotion rules the web. So coming back to Maslow, emotion is still there and this is still something that we care most about and never mind the channels. If something touches us, then we care about, we want to know more, we engage, we collaborate, we ask, we search more, we want to read more. And so Cecil the Line is way more interesting for the community right now than refugees. David Bowie, I talked about Major Tom. I'm not sure if you remember David Bowie. David Bowie is a rock star from the 70s who we liked a lot. He was a very strong but a bit strange person. And he just recently died. I think in 2015 he died. And uh, what was kind of strange is that on his um, uh, Twitter um, account, he followed a... Um, uh, a new, um, how to say, uh, a religious group uh, which would talk about or help people to think about death. So uh, somebody who knows he's going to die because he had cancer reaches out through um, Twitter, a digital tool to kind of follow God. And no comment on, from my side on that. I just thought it's a interesting fact. On the other hand, his wife, Iman, um, she said goodbye to her uh, beloved David Bowie um, through the channel of Instagram, where she posted um, some very specific pictures that she liked, and she said goodbye to him through this digital channel. And so, interestingly, people are using those digital channels for very intimate, for very private things and use those channels to express their feelings more and more. If you look at this gent on the right side, um, he has done a bit of traveling, he knows how to cook, he works out every day, his picture includes a little sample of his different life experiences. This is the most successful profile in Tinder. Now, you might know Tinder. Tinder is a dating tool on the internet where you can just look at profiles and you say yes or no to the profile and you can engage further. But this is the very, very um, uh, successful profile there, um, which reached uh, many, many uh, thousands of people um, interested. And out of this comes then as well a new word creation. So like Google st stands today for search, there is a kind of a word like Tinderization, which is a way of oversimplifying, leading to a yes or no decision phenomenon. So it's a very um, um, down to the basics um, decision, yes, no. I want to show you another movie. So I will switch again to the YouTube and I will switch off audio. This is, uh, I guess it comes out now very soon, the 2016 um, Google search movie because they bring it out every year. And just watch it and think yourself, how much of those images have you seen through YouTube, through Facebook, through searching for it through Google? Enjoy. For the people out there wondering what this is all about. 
whether it's about courage or controversy, well, I'll tell you what it's all about. It's about what happens from here. Thank you and good night. Live, fight like hell. It's not just about one person. It's about thousands of people. It's about all of us. Accepting one another. This morning, the Supreme Court recognized that the Constitution guarantees marriage equality. We're all different. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And while it may not be easy to get past the things you don't always understand, it is absolutely possible if we only do it together. Back to sound, back to the slides. So, if you want to be successful in business, if you want to do marketing, if you want to lead a group of people, you make better sure that you know them well. And so, let's look at them. They look like us, they talk like us, but they are almost a completely different species. The digital natives grew up surrounded by technological advances such as high-speed internet, mobile phones, social media. They learn and think differently and have different priorities in life than generations before. They grew up in prosperous, quiet times and are more visual than we can imagine. They love to share, share everything. The sooner companies get to know them, the better. Let's test you a little bit. You want you can put your answers in the chat. Can you translate B T W D R B T T Y L L O L L O L to D D A A M A? I guess you all can. This is common SMS language or Twitter language or how you chat. And still, even if you use common um, English language there your parents might not really understand what you are doing. Or when did you last time retweet something? So retweet is an expression of having something in Twitter and you um, push it further out. And what do you say with that if you retweet? It's not only that you like it, you spread it further out. You put your name behind. It's much more than just a like. Do you know how to send a selfie from your mobile to your friends and use a selfie stick? I guess you do. I can tell you, not more than I would say 20 years ago, I had to travel around the world for a company, Mercer, and I had to teach to managers how to make um, pictures and send them through the internet. They didn't know how to handle a digital camera and get the picture smallest that they can send it as an attachment by internet. I don't think I would have to teach you, or if I would try, you would tell me you know better. Subway surf for Candy Crush, I guess, no words more. Uh, billions are playing, so I guess as well you. When are you playing? In all those little times when you have two, 20 minutes free to play. It doesn't need two hours, it doesn't need a preparation. You just sit down, you wait for the bus, you play. And before you, um, uh, when you have a break at work or at the, at the university, you play. Spotify or Deezer has to do with what? Okay. I see a comment here that you cannot follow. Is this for everyone? Or is it okay? 
Please give me feedback. I see a comment from Joseph. It is okay. Okay, all right. Then sorry, Joseph, uh, perhaps you have to get out and come back in one more time, all right? So um, I am back on the slides. We are on slide 22. So I hope you can follow. All right, so we were here with Spotify and Deezer. Um, Spotify is a tool to download music and as well here uh, where I had to go to the shop and buy vinyls and uh, pay a lot of money and I had always to buy a whole vinyl with all the music. You have a total different approach to music today and we will see a little bit how this has changed as well the music industry. What is your hashtag? Again, a word that becomes common today and everyone knows it. Uh, because through has hashtags, you can um, be sure that you follow up on a specific topic. How did you get your last date? Did you perhaps use one of those digital apps um, like Tinder? Did you use boomerang mode in Instagram? Do you know what this is? Do you know what is Instagram? I guess you do. Here, I told you of my, um, if I'm not lecturing, I work as an e-consultant or as a consultant. And my technical teams are down in India. So my working colleagues' name are Sweta, Randy, Kajal, Sahu. So again, a part of digital world, a part of globalization, um, having the chance to work with great technical people in India every day for our clients here in Europe. We will talk a little bit about some of the gurus out there who write books or make speeches or present slides. And one of them, uh, which impressed me, was a kind of, let's call him the Harry Potter of um, gurus, internet gurus. His name is Shell Nordstrom's. And uh, you can watch his movie um, on the YouTube link. I will not show it now, it's too long. But what he talks, and this is his main um, topic here is, he says there are two main forces right now. And those forces, they get stronger and stronger. One being globalization, the other being information. What is globalization? I guess no explanation needed. You 16 or 14 who are here in the room currently, you are from all over the world and we build together a classroom. Um, and so you are part of such globalization. Globalization means it brings all the people together through digital. We don't have to travel. We don't have to spend money. You can work uh, from wherever you are and contribute to the world in private as well in business. What is meant on information? On information, it's clear. He says we are surrounded by so much information that our brains start a little bit to react on it. Not that the brain changes, it will need millions, but we will change in our thinking habits. So asking you, do you know the phone number of your partner? Or is anyone right now making notes? I guess not. Why? Because the phone number of your partner is where? On your mobile phone. And where is your mobile phone? not more than one meter away from you, 24 hours. Would you make notes? No, you know, we are recording that. So you can watch it again and you can as well download the slides. You can connect with me through LinkedIn and ask further questions. So why should you make notes? But Shiel Nordstrom goes farther. He says, not only will you only try to remember relevant things, you will as well, if you're in business, you will stop planning. You will not have budget talks. You don't need to think ahead one year, two months, perhaps not even for tomorrow, because you will have to learn how to react on the moment. As we know, when we went through all those different crises, financial, political crises, all those experts there who wrote books and got millions of it, were they right? Normally not. And they get wronger and wronger and wronger. Because the world is just too complex. There is too much information. This information goes all together. And for this, nobody can really foresee what happens tomorrow. 
Therefore, yes, learn to find the answer on a certain topic that is relevant right now, right now. And this is what you need to do and what you will do in future. That's at least what Mr. Shell Nordstrom says. You remember that slide at the beginning, how many people are online and how, what are they doing, how they are interacting with all those channels. There's only 20 out of hundreds of thousand channels out there. But who or what do they ask? Now, I told you in my first slide that I will talk about Hall. Now, who is Hall? I will show you. can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Al? This must be it. If you want to see more, if you want to see more, you have to watch the movie. The movie is a movie from 1968, so quite a long time ago. And it talks about a time in 2001. It's called Space Odyssey 2001 by Stanley Kubrick. It's considered one of the really greatest science fiction movies out there before perhaps Star Wars came in. But um, Hall is a computer. And Hall is a very clever computer. A computer that actually starts to learn and the sequence you saw, that was the point where he took over. And the movie will end not very well for the, this astronaut and for human beings because the computer just decides to make his own decisions. And the interesting thing is, does anyone know what stands Hall for? H-A-L. Any idea? Because the name was not chosen by accidents, but they didn't want to name it in 1968 as what it is. So, if you think about the alphabet, what is the alphabet before H? It's I. What is, oh, sorry, after? It's I. What is the alphabet after A? It's B. And what is the alphabet after L? It's M. IBM. IBM was at that time what today is Google or Facebook. So it was the biggest information um, uh, company and they had a huge computer started to build, the Big Blue, I think it was called. And that was still the time where people thought Big Blue will never defend the chess champion of the world. As we know now, today's computer do easily. So the current reigning chess champion of the world is not a human being, it's a computer. And so if at that time it was IBM, so we have to think a little bit, has it been replaced today? Are we any further? We are not in 2001. Let's look a little bit at Google in this case. Now, let's call Google the machine. Let's call Google Paul. And what you see here is um, Google Trends, which shows you a little bit how trendy are some of the search terms that we are using. And the blue line you see is the search, what is the best car? Now, this is not very surprising that people ask what is the best car, especially when you consider Google is much better in answering questions. When you ask the Eiffel Tower, um, some 10 years ago in Google, it would lead you to perhaps a Wikipedia article or an article of the home web page of the Eiffel Tower. But if you ask today, it will show you immediately an answer, how tall is the Eiffel Tower? Because Google just thinks this is the most relevant answer on everything on Eiffel Tower. People normally want to know how high is the Eiffel Tower. And if you ask today, what is the height of the Eiffel Tower or what is the best car? Google will try to give you a real answer on that. But what is this red line, which is almost on the same height of this, what is the best car question? These are people asking, what is the meaning of life? Again, think about it. Why would we ask Google, what is the meaning of life? And then you see this peak that we have here. Any idea what it is? 
it was a very special date. It was the, uh, I think, the 11th, 11th, 2011. And so all those people who think the world must go down, they wrote and they peaked at this time and said, uh, this is the end of the world. Now, good luck, it didn't happen. But still, people were worried and started to ask even more at that time, what is the meaning of life? That's why there was such a peak. Now, this is as well a reason, because we use Google so much, that this next generation is sometimes as well called the Google generation. Now, Google is a great tool, and certainly it's something that we can use to our best, but there is always, it's never black and white, there are always gray shades. And so Google comes as well with a price and a kind of time bomb. Google is not only a search engine, it's a reputation management system. A system that tells us a little bit how we should think, which influences us. Now I want to show it to you in a very simple, very simple sample. If you look at those four pictures, these are two different countries. And in both I have been. One is Switzerland and one I have traveled. And I can tell you, it's a very nice country. But I would believe that none of you, if you will ask for Google, would want to travel in one of those. Now, the first one you might have guessed is Switzerland. So if you go in Google Image Search and Google Image Search works exactly the same way than the normal search. It shows pictures on relevance. So if you search for Switzerland, Google will think, what are the most relevant pictures representing Switzerland? To no surprise, you will see lakes, mountains, animals in the mountains, snow, all that. Typical Swiss, right? Now, what was the other country? The other country was Iraq. I have been in Iraq 15 years ago, 20 years ago, not so sure. And I have traveled a little bit around, and it's a beautiful country. But if you ask Google, Iraq, this is what it shows. Now, Google will say, sorry, it's not our mistake. You make what comes here. But it's staggering. If you search in Google image for Iraq, not the only first 10 pictures or the first 100 pictures. No, the first 1,000 pictures are all pretty much the same. There is almost not one landscape picture coming. It's all about situations from current news or from news that even are no more so current, but um, are still considered relevant um, for Google on the topic of Iraq. I didn't ask for Iraq war. I didn't ask for Saddam. I didn't ask for anything else than just Iraq. And so think about that and think when you next time search Google, how relevant, how real is the result that it shows? If you ask a question, what is the best car? If you ask a question, what is the best school? If you ask a question, where should I travel? If you check a hotel review, all that you have to consider at least. We can go on with other samples. I can't show it to you here because I cannot push websites. But if you go for CEO boss as a search, search in Google Images, what is interesting is that you will see only um, man. So it, Google gives you an answer. CEO boss must be man, man wearing tie. Okay. But actually, the reality is that still 27% of CEOs, if you ask Google US, for example, are women. It wouldn't show the women. On the other side, if we would check, check I, I, I didn't change the, the, the top thing here, so not construction worker, but look in the yellow box. If we search for telemarketers, then we will find much more pictures from women. Telemarketers are the, 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 the people sitting at the phone. But actually, this is absolute equal. 50% are women, 50% are men. But Google gives you kind of filtered answer, which is not the reality. So what is real? Are you sure that you know how to 
ensure that yourself don't get trapped in all those distorted views of Google alike? You might have thought the internet is this. You and are surrounded by a beautiful world of unlimitless information. And you could really access it the way you want. You can ask everything and you can get the answers back. You can be critical, search them and find your own answer, your own right. But Google and the like will not even let this happen. What you experience in Google is much more this. It's you and around you is a you bubble. What does that mean? If you are searching something, let's say you go to Amazon and you search for Lord of the Rings fantasy book. What will happen? Not only will you be followed by Amazon for all the next websites that you visit in the next three weeks, but Amazon will next time when you visit Amazon suggest you Harry Potter because it puts you in the bubble of fantasy and you will get stuck in this bubble and it will be very difficult to get out of it and get uh, um, uh, a new book from Pollock which is crime or playing in the US. So this is a kind of bubble that is built up which it's not easy to escape. Obviously, some of you know how to escape it. If you don't allow cookies, if you, uh, cr if you use browsers in a protected environment, then you can kind of guarantee that um, you actually see a bigger internet and are not completely inside this filter bubble. But I tell you, it's not that easy. And you might know it in your browser settings of the laptop or of the tablet. But do you know how to delete all that or make sure you are on a pure internet on a mobile device? Because in a mobile device, additional to just knowing you, it comes as well inside that they know where you are. So they will push information that is relevant for where you currently are. And this can be cool, but I think it's better that you know it. Now, this filter bubble came up from a TED um, talk uh, some years back by a guy called Eli Parisi, Parisi. and um, he really showed in a very nice movie, you can watch that still even if it's two, three years old, um, how, um, you, how we all are living in such a bubble and how the whole internet is not really available to us and all those tools getting better and better, they really create our world within the whole internet and again it's good to know i tried it out when i looked for bp british petrol company so i just looked for british petrol and um, i looked it on two different computers on the left side it's my private computer and on the right side is my business computer and i used the same internet i used the same browser i did it the same time still the results are different. So even here, it knows from the history what I did of how the computer is set up, it will bring me a different search result. You can try that out. This happens, of course, not only in uh, Google, but for example, as well in Facebook. This is a screenshot from a research that has been done in the US where people were looking for political parties. Blue is uh, democratic, red is conservative. And um, um, over time, the same person in his Facebook saw only blue postings. And so this person got a kind of wrong idea that there are no more conservatives out there. But wrong. What did Facebook do? Because this guy who was searching was more on the democratic side. He was clicking more the blue ones. So Facebook was learning and said, okay, this guy is not interested in the red ones. So only pushes the blue ones out. So again, you get a distorted view. You get a distorted idea how about reality without having any possibility to, to change it in that aspect. 
So it's very difficult to talk back to Facebook and tell them, hey guys, I want to see the whole picture, not only my picture. And it goes on and goes on with different channels and different tools that are all using the same technology. Of course, this one is great for marketing because we do use it for remarketing. I'm sure you have seen that often that when you went to see a Jeep website um, and looked for different models of Jeep, and then later you went to visit your news website or you went to visit um, another website that you often um, uh, visit to, to get information, you might always see little banners from Jeep popping up. Or even if you go back to YouTube to look for the latest uh, Metallica video, you might suddenly see in your search a Jeep marketing video. And all this comes as well very thought through by Google um, managing your uh, managing what you did before uh, with it, so the Jeep website, and then pushing you this information back um, into the websites that you use. And obviously, when I would uh, visit the same website, I wouldn't see the same Jeep um, advertising, but perhaps I would see, I don't know, something about a new book on Lord of the Rings. So everyone will see his own world. This showing you the whole thing a little bit more visually. So when I prepared for this lecture, because I was on the Jeep website um, before, it would show me wherever I go, um, Jeep banners and give me information about it that I should click and get more information which is called remarketing, but is actually based on same technologies than what we looked at before. So what may be genius for target marketing, for marketing um, products is as well a questionable um, thing on other issues. So what is if you want to buy a totally different car? Not a Jeep, not even an SUV. SUV. Will you ever know what else is around? Or, as I said before, if you don't want to read um, fantasy anymore, or perhaps you were only searching for fantasy for a present for your friends. And so it was actually perhaps not really um, relevant for yourself. And you're still trapped in this world. As I said, there are technical things you can do against it. Cookies, uh, serve private, erase history, turn off target ads, go incognito. But believe me, and Google and the like will work on that and they will do everything they can to um, make it more hard for you, everyone, to delete that and get out into the free internet. So, digital enhanced and new you. Let's look a little bit more in details on, let's say, the bad side of the next generation as some um, older thinking people might um, consider it. Um, when I was a child, uh, we always heard from Knicke. Knicke is this not very friendly looking guy on the right, who was a German guy who told us how to behave. And so if Knicke would still be alive today, what would he say about the net generation or the Google generation? He would say overwhelmed, overconnected, overprotected, and overserved. And so, if you want to read more about that, there is a book, Generation Y. I put a slogan down left, don't buy. I consider it a very one-sided, boring book. It continues with that. There is another guy who was very successful with his uh, book, uh, Digital uh, Dementia, uh, by Manfred Spitzer. And um, he said they are dumper than we are at the same age. There is attention deficit disorder. They can't focus on anything. You don't read and or they don't read and are pure com poor communicators. So all the negative aspect of the new generation. If we look at one of the aspects is certainly mobile and mobile um, leads to screen addicted 
to losing social skills. People who are sitting together are glued to their mobile phones. They are not interested in any um, healthy activities. It's all digital. It's digital gaming. It's digital um, communication. Everything there. So the worst of worst um, in killing every interpersonal um, uh, things. You can check that out yourself. There is a very interesting application which you can download and will monitor your activities. And you might be surprised um, when I ask you how often would you check your mobile phone and just look at the screen. You might say perhaps 20 times a day. Um, if you use this tool, it might show you that it's way more than that. So if you are daring download this app to your um, mobile device, uh, it only works, I think, for Android right now. And it will give you a clear analytical how much time you spend, how often you click on your phone, how often you look at your phone. And it gives you a very interesting feedback about your own behavior. Another point, Mr. Um, the, the critical person would mention is that they have no shame. They rate everything and everybody. So you might know about this uh, Rate My Professor application, which is very successful in the States. And I know the American professors, American lecturers don't like it too much because they think it's unfair. You cannot really rate the quality of a professor. And I think, yes, uh, um, you actually can because if you're not relevant, then people will not listen to you or will uh, give you a feedback that you're not relevant and then you shouldn't lecture anymore. So I think it's actually a pretty good thing. But it's obviously the whole um, lowering of um, the, um, the shame factor uh, is current and is visible on the internet. They are bullying friends online. They are violent. They have no work ethic and will be bad employees. They don't give a hoot. This another point uh, representative here, certainly Mr. WikiLeak, um, who um, came out and made the world very much more transparent. But on the other hand, um, uh, people are very critical on it and said uh, uh, this is not the right thing to do. But the internet, of course, enables to spread news, reality or fake news um, on the spot and does good and does bad. When it's about music, movies, they violate intellectual property rights, download music, swap songs, and share anything they can on peer-to-peer -peer networks with no respect for the rights of the creator or owners. 95% of downloaded songs have not been paid for. And these are statistics that are still um, uh, in place. Here is Mr. Kim.com, who is still sitting in uh, New Zealand waiting for his extradition in the US. And um, he has owned a very big website where you can upload and download movies and um, uh, music. And this was considered a criminal thing to do, which, of course, is a big question. I don't have an answer on that myself. Uh, Mr. Kim.com seems not to be uh, extremely nice. But, um, what he represents is, of course, a question that you sure will have to uh, deal with. Um, who owns what and what is okay to be done? One of the things that I think are actually more interesting is about the moral aspect of it. If you ask um, people think it's okay to cheat on a test, there are um, only 18% who say it's morally acceptable. But if you ask okay to download music from the internet for free, then the opinion would be 83% think, yes, it's okay. Obviously, if you ask people and take a CD from the shelf and take it in your pocket and run out, then it's considered um, not acceptable. So the moral aspect of this uh, thing is 
to talk. I see my screen of video is blinking sometimes. Are you having a, a okay picture still and the slides are going well? Everything all right? Can you give me a feedback on that just to make sure? Now is okay, but before was distorted, I guess. Okay. All right, good. And I continue. The video is not very stable. Yes, right. I saw that. So I will see if I see that it's not stable, I will perhaps switch it off and you only hear for a while. Okay, correct. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Now, taking this sample that I said, uh, I want to tell you a little story which I think was. Um, uh, huh, okay, yes, I can disconnect. Let me tell you a story about uh, business aspect of it. Um, it was in the news, you can find it on the internet. There was a company, I think an uh, insurance company, and um, they paid a lot of money um, for a uh, security um, tool which should prevent that somebody can uh, hack into their computers and in their network. And still, um, their IT uh, person found out that there were some Chinese uh, digital traces on their server and they couldn't understand why. And so they called the company, they paid for a lot of money uh, for the security and said, look guys, we paid a lot of money, but it seems not to work because um, uh, they are Chinese hacking in our LAN. And this of course is not okay. Now the company, who provided the security, they were believing in their, in their um, software and said, listen, before we say our tool is not working, uh, give us some days, we will have a look and go into your system in your land and observe. After two days, they come up and said, um, yes, they found something. And what they found is uh, there was a guy called Bob. Uh, he was for many years the best programmer for the security, uh, for the, the insurance company. Still, his browsing history revealed a rather relaxed working approach. So at nine o'clock, he arrived and surfed Reddit for a couple of hours. He watched some cat videos. At 11.30, he took lunch. Uh, he only came back at one o'clock in the afternoon. Then he did some eBay. Then he did some Facebook and LinkedIn. And then he, 4.30, he ended the day with an update email to the management normally saying everything done and he was considered or he was in the books one of the most reliable um, programmer of this company but okay so why or how was that related to this problem with the chinese now how did he do his job they found out that this guy in the morning outsourced his job to china and so he had time to do whatever he wanted, but still his Chinese colleagues who were paid from him for a fraction of the money, they did a great job. And so they actually fulfilled the objectives of the guy for every day. And so he got an extremely good work done. Still, of course, he lost his job because obviously you cannot do that and you cannot um, push um, your data out to um, whatever other country, that is not okay. But I thought the story kind of represents what we talked before about with this way of shift of morality, what can be done and how things can be done. And actually he uh, fixed the problem very elegant and very successful for a while. Another story, nice picture of this uh, young lady who uh, pushed a picture of hers on uh, Facebook, I think, you know, Instagram. And, um, but there is a sad story behind it because um, she felt later into this uh, mountain down because she tried to make a selfie and put one step too far down. And so what does that lead us to is perhaps the next slide, which doesn't need much words went to the moon, took five photos, went to the bathroom, took 37 photos. So again, one of the negative aspects of 
generation here is the latest narcissistic me generation very much focused on yourself oops sorry that was one too much big brother reality show actually you might know that from your country so you put people into a room and you watch how they talk to each other first friendly and then you push them a little bit to the limits and they start to behave more and more nasty. Now, what started as a reality show format is really today getting a reality itself and so big that they talk about the Big Brother problem at the World Economic Forum back in 2014 and repeated it as well in 2015. So the Big Brother thing that you are always observed, that you're always um, enables to really push information through a huge uh, group of people is something that is standing for this next generation uh, people. Talking about wearable technologies as well here, something that started big and everyone was talking about Google Glasses and then after a while it went down and people thought it's a big failure thing but believe me it will come i mean the whole wearable technology is something that went a little bit too high on a peak but this is a natural um, behavior that things if it's a cool technology build up gets a hype then it goes down and then it starts to really build up with um, more um, sustainable technologies. So it might not be Google Glass, which will um, be the winner, but there will be certainly various uh, wearable um, around, and they will not make the internet easier. So all the problems we talked before about being um, manipulated, being fed with information that you might not want, as well giving information from yourself away which you don't want will be uh, enhanced through wearable technologies and all the uh, things that we call the internet of things so we are now at the end of the first part so i will close this presentation and i will load a second one so you can as well load this presentation i hope i get here the right one Yep. Okay. So we are now in the beginning of presentation two of the second part of our lecture today. Now, I said a lot of critical things, even bad, about the net generation. And I guess since you are part of it, um, you might say, what is going on? What is this guy telling? And uh, therefore, I question, do you agree? Is this all about the generation? And I hope you will say, no, it is not. We are great people and we have a great future and we do things better than you old guys and the old generation guys. Now, if you ask some of the gurus like Shell Nostrum, I already presented to you top right, or if you go for Seth Godin, or if you talk about Don Tapscott, those guys are agreeing with you and would say, no, those, uh, new generation actually has a lot to say and a lot of quality and let's listen to a little bit to Don Tapscott who is one of the, the really great uh, people and he has written a lot of really cool books and listen to what he says about the net generation collaboration can occur on an astronomical basis now, a new generation is opening up the world as well. I started studying kids about 15 years ago, so actually 20 years ago now, and I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are prodigies. <laughs> and, uh, but then I noticed all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with a few hundred uh, kids, and I came to the conclusion that this is the first generation to come of age in the digital age to be bathed in bits. I called them the net generation. I said, these kids are different. They have no fear of technology because it's 
not there. It's like the air, sort of like I have no fear of a refrigerator. And uh, there, there's no more powerful force to change every institution than the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. The The whole talk by yourself again. I repeat that all the links are in the slides when you download them, either placed on the slide or in the notes. And I mean, further than uh, Tap Scott, you saw that was a talk from TED. So if you don't know the website, TED.com, go there and they are really just a collection of the greatest speeches of greatest people around. I mean, there is just on almost every topic, not only in digital, but they are fantastic topics normally always at about 15 to 18 minutes talk and it's just a great great source um, of the internet which really can bring you a lot of added value so Dodd tapscott talks about the people and their competencies and what are they good in so let's look a little bit more about those um, questions that we have to ask ourselves what drives the natives? What do they like? How are they different in how they perceive products, services, brands? And how can you, this would be a slide specifically for marketing people, marketeers, but it can as well be if you're just a business owner or if you are just um, out there doing um, any profession, how can you reach out to them? How can you collaborate? How can you en en engage them? And do they want to be engaged? Now, before we talk about those great things, back one more time to Shell Nordstrom. One of his favorite slides is that one, and it shows a green line, which is you and me, and we grow clever by the day. So Tapscott is right, yes, the today's generation is certainly more clever than generations before. But then there is a disturbing red line, red line sorry. The red line shows the information, the knowledge, the, all the new things that is coming in. And this, you see, is growing in much faster ways than our brain or than our knowledge is achieved. And therefore, I think Shell is quite right that more and more you will not be able just to learn something and then um, live from it, your profession, for a lifetime. It will not even be possible that you continue learning. So if you finish um, the ABMS school, obviously you will have to dive in into new schools and new learning. But even this might not help you because it's just too much out there. If you just look at digital marketing, all the channels that are out there, all the techniques that are out there, so you might never be able to really um, grasp all and be an expert on all. And therefore, coming back to what we said before, more important is really that you sharpen your um, competencies and your skills in using the internet to your best advantage, using it the right way. Altogether, yes, there is hope. There are new behavior and new strengths out there. Certainly, you are much, much more technical. It's not that, again, your brain has become multitasking. But in doing it every day, of course, you get used to something. And if you do something multiple ways, your um, brain or your behavior adapts to it. And so you are a specialist in uh, mobile phones. You use your thumb uh, much more good you would know how to handle cameras, not because you have a camera, but you have a phone with a good camera. You are Facebook prayers, you are messengers 24-7, you, uh, you engage in YouTube, uh, you have tablets, you are a citizen journalist, what, which means that everything you observe, you already push on your social channels and you comment it and ask your followers or your friends to um, comment it too or to share it even. Um, you are digital project managers, 
all by yourself, even if you're by profession something totally different, because your calendar might be on your mobile phone and um, you manage your communications through mobile to digital channels. So all that are things that are pretty technical, but you manage them and there are not many courses anymore in companies on technical things. Of course, if you need to learn a programming language or whatever, this still goes down to the book and you have to learn the coding and whatever. But a lot of those technical things that were really topics of trainings for managers, for business people, they are done. People are just growing up and my daughter handles today already um, the iPad and the mobile phone better than I do. Specifically as well because she is not reading a book, because she is just trying it out. She doesn't get panicked if it doesn't work. And of course, as you call shy technology, technologies become more and more um, logic means um, the success of the iPhone is not that it was a technical high-end tool, but the success was based on that it came natural. So swiping with the thumb, what you need to look at the photo album is something that is pretty natural. It is pretty same like if you turn the page in your magazine. And so nobody has to read a book how to use the iPhone because everything is kind of adapted to the user. That's the great thing. Whether you are shopping for cornflakes, concert tickets or honeymoon in Paris, the internet has changed how they decide what to buy. So Google calls that the zero moment of truth because before there were um, the stimulus, which was just the first idea that you had um, of getting involved in a new product. And then there was the first moment of truth. That, that's what when you saw it in the shop. And it was then the second moment of truth when you experienced the product. But Google came up and said, with the new channels, with the new um, um, behavior of net generations, there is as well a zero moment of truth. And have a look at the video. I hope this is the right one. Marketers have been using a three-step mental model of marketing for a long time. Stimulus, like developing a TV ad. Shelf, focusing on point of sale, which has historically been called the first moment of truth. And experience, people take the product home and experience it. They could have a good experience or a bad experience, and they share it. This is the second moment of truth. If marketers spend time on these three steps, they should succeed, right? We investigated this theory. We conducted a comprehensive study with research partner Shopper Sciences using 5,000 shoppers across 12 categories, from groceries to cars and financial products. The goal, show where influence takes place as shoppers move from undecided to decided. We found that the average shopper used 10.4 sources of information, up from 5.3 sources in 2010. We asked shoppers what sources they used to make decisions, when they used it, and how influential is each source. When we lined up their responses, a fourth step appeared in the marketing mental model, the zero moment of truth. This is when consumers do their research, get smart about alternatives, read reviews, look for coupons and comparison shop, all before going to the shelf. When we compare the steps, the zero moment of truth pops up as highly relevant and influential. Consumers have changed the way they have approached decision making. As a marketer, have you kept up or are you still using the old mental model? There's a new mental model now and marketers that can now keep all these steps spinning gain a very competitive advantage in today's marketplace. So if you want to be successful, you better understand how in your own business world you capture or you um, find in this zero moment of truth. Another term that um, uh, Google created is called the micro moments, and as well here, enjoy a little movie.
grinding sound when you turn the key? So I guess those two, the zero moment of truth and the micro moments must somehow play together. So what you need to do to engage the next generation is really be there at the moment when they search for it, when they want more information and wrap it in those moments, in those stories, um, which are relevant, which are emotional, which are giving really uh, advantage in getting the right information at the right time. So this is certainly one of the core marketing success of today. Another one which shows that very nice is here we see the inauguration of the Pope in 2005. So where loads of people gather for a moment that is important for them and then look at the same picture in 2013. And not only is it um, incredible to see um, that everyone has a, um, a mobile phone or a tablet which can make uh, pictures, but I guess 50% of those people will not only make the picture, but they will upload it in the same moment to the internet. And so you can be sure that currently everywhere where something relevant happens, relevant means relevant for a specific audience, it will find its way into the internet and be there, which of course is a great thing, um, to do and has great power. So there it goes to citizen journalism, it goes to that every truth is captured and put um, online, visible and shareable for everyone. But mobile by itself, of course, is something that is incredible importance. Um, right now, and believe me, I've worked with many companies still um, emphasize too much on desktop or laptop or even tablets and really neglect a little bit the small screens and whatever business you're in whatever country you're in um, it will always be around the 50 to 50 right now between uh, especially on this zero moment of truth it's even more on mobile so you better make sure whatever you want to push out to a digital channel, make it as well available and specially um, fit for a mobile screen, not only in the look, but as well on content. So if you search for something and information um, on a mobile, you probably want different answers, you want different possibilities, action, call to actions than on your laptop at home. Another Thing that changes and as I think changes to a very positive aspect um, it's the co collaboration that you do every day or that net generations do um, um, every day through Facebook through social media and their private goes of course as well further as well into um, uh, business life so as well here um, when I traveled around for Mercer some years back there was a big um, issue was knowledge sharing, which uh, means nothing else than if you are part of a team of a company, um, you are not only the person who works, but as well, you inherit the whole knowledge of the company. And it's up to the management and up to the people then to share that with all the others. And my part was mainly to tell to people that they should do it and that it's good for them, it's good for the company, and they shouldn't be set to share. 
And I can tell you, I don't think I would make much money with that topic traveling around the world today. The younger generation is just rethinking how they approach business. Uh, they are very much open to share, and um, this, of course, is to the good of the company. Virtuality, same like we are now in a virtual classroom. My daily job is 100% virtual. I deal with so many people around the world, it would not be possible um, to be traveling. Good luck, I wouldn't want to travel. I was traveling a lot when I was very happy. And so we have here the screenshots of a tool that works obviously in mobile as well on a tablet or, uh, or computer um, laptop. And it's really my working tool where I collaborate similar than Facebook, but just on a business level with all the people. Do I care if it's this system? No, obviously not. I work with whatever system is given. All those systems have learned a lot from Facebook, have learned a lot from other tools, and are working the same way. Do we need to learn by um, books when we get such a new tool? Normally not. We just get in, we try out, we get some hints back, and then we use the tool very productively. So with Generation Y, this comes from a Price Waterhouse report. Coming into the business, hierarchies have to disappear. Generation Y expects to work in communities of mutual interest and passion, not structured hierarchies. Consequently, people management strategies will have to change so that they look more like Facebook and less like the pyramid structures we are used to. I think that wraps up very nicely what this new generation in business can achieve and how to get them engaged. This leads us then to something called Blue Ocean Leader, um, which is a big topic by itself, so I can't jump into that. But it's changing the whole, based on what we read before from Price Waterhouse, it has to lead to a change of the top guy. The top guy cannot be, obviously, if the, if the workforce is thinking different, you need somebody in the top who is thinking different too. And they will still need the time to go through because traditional um, top managers are in their 50s and they are um, digital migrants like I am. And normally they would not really yet be at that sharing level, this understandable well, this technical level. Um, and they will still ask for other um, workforce, but they have to learn. And I guess they will learn pretty fast. For some being good, for some being bad. So if you think about Amazon or if you think about um, um, uh, eBay and you think about uh, some of the fashion online um, shops, they are, of course, extremely um, successful. Um, but it leads, of course, as well to um, businesses that are not that successful. But they are still businesses who believe or have believed for a long time that their uh, business model will never go digital. One of them is really on car. Uh, cars are still thought to be sold only with a vendor at base where you have to shake hands. And so in 2009, there were the first uh, shy discussions going on on the internet. Why can we not buy a car online? And then in 2013, still, can car buying ever go digital? And only in 2014, it's now um, finally one brand, Volvo, which starts really strong um, online car sales. Obviously, Volvo is a, a, a good choice, or it's clear why it's Volvo. Volvo has a very good reputation so far. They have not been in any scandals. They are normally people who buy a Volvo. They know exactly what they want, and they know exactly what they get. Therefore, Volvo is certainly one of those car brands which can safely go online. But as all business, others will join and will have to join. Coming to Metallica, Metallica had a, a steep learning curve and they made one, one, did all, even in Wikipedia. Um, 
that was at the time of Napster. Napster was a peer-to-peer -peer download, and um, Metallica complained badly, um, publicly, and even hired a lawyer fighting against their fans who downloaded songs from them for free. And was that uh, well received? Obviously not. Um, the fans hated it, and Metallica really had to go through a bad time um, uh, and uh, lost a lot of credit with their fans for one, two, three years. But they make a turn. So if you look now Metallica up in the digital worlds, you find great movies posted from them. You find them in Spotify and you can download their music. You find YouTube movies with the concerts, which are posted by them in high uh, quality movies. So they have changed because they have understood that without their fans, they are just nothing. And um, if the fans are thinking it's okay to pay less for music, not music, but go perhaps more to concerts, then um, that's an alternative and music just has to change. It was as well an interesting story of one of my other favorite bands, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd was never in Spotify, and they brought out a remaster of one of their famous songs, Wish You Were Here, and they posted on their website and say, look guys, if there are one million downloads um, happening when we post Wish You Were Here um, in Spotify, and that was the first and only song at that time, then we will put our whole back catalog on Spotify. Now it needed, I think, um, some few days and they have reached one million and it went very fast into the multiple millions and right now there are nine four downloads when I made the last screenshots and Pink Floyd reacted and said okay even for Pink Floyd fans um, they are digital now and um, they appreciate and they followed their fans which I guess is always the right thing to do. New chances, new business models. Um, so when the music um, industry complains about the internet being uh, uh, their, uh, how do you say, their death zone, um, there are bands who were very successful in just changing their business model and um, did um, do very well on the internet these days. And um, so it's not about that something gets destroyed by digital, but it just gets changed on digital. And those uh, companies, those business models who know and how and find ways how to adjust survive. When we talk about gaming as well, gaming was always considered something that you do alone. Um, who are frustrated, who are off from this world, but actually today's gaming is everything but not alone. It's a big collaboration going on, um, and uh, those games that are online and are multiple player um, level, they are highly strategic, they are very complex, um, and funny enough, um, uh, there are really companies today who search specifically for gamers, because they can act well um, in a very um, hard, difficult, fast environment. Um, and they know that they have to go different scenarios to find the best solution. They can very fast analyze um, behaviors and things like that. So it's not anymore about being multiple millions of orcs in one night, but really playing and surviving in a very difficult um, strategy um, situation. And this can be very positive for uh, business. And specifically on uh, big science uh, problems, there was a very interesting case in 2011 where chemical experts couldn't find the, um, the answer on a specific protein folding issue and they hired um, um, gamers who um, played it in a, in a game version of it and they solved it in three weeks. If you're interested in that story, it's, I think it's highly interesting. You have all the links in the slide. As well, the female gamers were a neglected um, force here. 
um, female were always interested in gaming, but they were not really um, well taken care for. But as well here, when once the, the gaming industry understood what attracts female gamers, it works very well. And today there are 52% um, of gamers women, especially because of those very small um, games that are cute, that you play not for hours, not the whole night through, but you play in those little moments that you have for yourself. And of course, as well, all those games that are um, having um, the, the remote control where you can actually interact with the game, you move to it, you get out of the sofa, you get out of your dark room, and you collaborate with your friends, you play together in the same room on one game, things like that. All together, we remember at the beginning, we said that uh, the net generation has lost the capacity to communicate because they are glued to the mobile. Actually, it's not true. There is more collaboration going on than ever. Um, there are just different channels how we communicate. So for somebody who is used to sit at the table and look each other in the eyes and talk, um, it seems that the, uh, the today's generations are disconnected. But what they perhaps don't understand is that they are very well connected, not only to the people that are sitting with them at the table, but even more so with people out there. Obviously, it's easy to, um, uh, to share things with love brands. So in older presentation, it was all about social media being uh, relevant for Alfa Romeos, for Coca-Cola, for Apple, for um, Harley Davidson, all those brands that are related to emotion and have a very strong um, corporate image. Um, but I think today, um, every business, even if it's not that attractive, needs to collaborate, needs to share, and needs to get the audiences in, uh, involved. Technology is certainly a part of life for everyone, but even more so, um, there was this fantastic word coined prosumer, which means nothing else than somebody who produces and consumes the same time. And uh, it leads then to co-creation. Again, a huge topic where we could spend hours talking about it. But you might really see this when you look at um, a tool like um, Wikipedia, where you have the doers active. So Wikipedia being an encyclopedia, which worked very well, which was very critic at the beginning. People said, why would it work? Because they are not experts there. But today, everyone knows it's actually one of the best or the best up-to-date encyclopedia ever. It's all for free, and it's created by users. Now, why does it work? Have a look at dolphins. How much did change about dolphin facts in the last, let's say, three months? I guess the answer would be not much. The dolphin is still a dolphin. It has been the last thousands and millions of years. But if we go to Wikipedia, and I'm not sure if you ever have looked at the history of Wikipedia, you might see that how many people did post a change. Now, you see there was a posting I just did. There was a posting in November. Uh, at 8, there was one in October 30, there was October 10, there was September 21, September 15. And when you look at the people, those are not real names. I'm not sure if Dr. Christie really calls himself. Deep03 certainly is not a person with a real name. So those people that engage here are not even here for fame. They don't want to show off and say, we are the best a dolphin expert out there. But they care about this specific animal dolphin. And everyone out there, you including, me including, are caring about something. So for me, it might not be dolphins. For me, it might be Lord of the Rings or Metallica or Silver Surfer. And so about this topic, I know a lot. I'm very engaged. And if somebody would post something 
into Wikipedia, which is not relevant or even not correct, I will start the discussion and I will take it very, very serious. That's why Wikipedia is working so well, because we are prosumers, we want to be engaged, we want to share, we want to um, be there and, and, and stay for a stand for our love product. Now, if it works for Harley Davidson, it works as well for just a hotel out there or for a car sharing company or even for your local um, pizza company out there who want to become um, involved and will become part of the whole business model. Obviously, there are thousands of people out there. That's a bit the problem. The unsuccessful ones you will not find, but they are great ideas who are young and just jump over the traditional idea of how business should be done. And that's or a suggestion to you out there using those things and come up with crazy ideas and push them out and if you fail you learn something if you succeed be what is working well are things that are authentic that are real so there is so much information out there which is trivial which is unrelevant so still um, movies that are really making a good point, showing it not really almost like they are very, very famous. This is a beautiful one, which as well I uh, suggest you to have a look at. Because we are running out of time, so I will try to finish in the next. Now, you certainly have in your countries as well, those um, reality shows here. We have one screenshot from Britain Got Talent where you have unknown people coming on stage and trying to become famous singers. Now, this guy was one of the big stories of Britain Got Talent. He was a car salesman. He was not the most attractive man. He came on stage and he sung pretty well. It was not the best, but it was the story that made it. It was a scripted reality show because they put him at the end of the show, they put the camera very close on his face, he looked like he can't handle life, um, they showed the audience, they looked a little bit annoyed, they showed the juries, they looked as well annoyed and thought, oh God, another guy who can't sing, and then he surprised them all and sing. Now, it's not the question how good he is, it's just the question how they put it on the screen to make a story out of it and pushed it up much bigger, and it became a success. As well here, you can look for Paul Potts on the internet and find all relevance about that. So one of the sign of time which works well is the scripted reality. Here another sample from GoPro, uh, which shows a cat um, with a um, enhanced skateboard, enhanced through a GoPro, and she is um, having the uh, uh, role of her life um, going through different situations. Again, it looks like a documentary, but actually is not really. It's scripted reality, so it's taking a real thing and pimping it up a little bit to make it look even better. I want to show you one sample here, and if you have never seen that, this is great fun to watch. It happens in Belgium.
don't know if you have seen what I posted in the chats. Uh, think about what is real, who are the actors, who are just people. So I guess it's difficult to say in this aspect what are really what is real, but it's certainly engaging great movie that is uh, really well for viral success. Leading us to a topic that I have uh, um, put in a, another lecture I did, I think three weeks ago, specific on native advertisements. So um, there is, I think, no recording out there, but um, perhaps I will repeat it one time. It's certainly one of those very interesting um, new ways of reaching out to audiences where you post very relevant stories um, which are not so much just blunt marketing, but telling a story that is relevant for the audience, but still leading it to the brand. So another big topic by itself. Here as well, a sample of Native, which I liked a lot. And I told you at the very beginning, we will visit Metropolis and Gotham. So Turkish airline, when the movie came out, Superman versus Batman, they brought out on their website that you could book um, the same way that you would book another trip to any other city of the world, to Metropolis and Gotham. They made the whole website look exactly like if you visit Paris or Geneva or London. Um, uh, and uh, you could see movies about it. You got tips what to do in Gotham, what not to do, and so on. And obviously, when you want to do book, they just said, sorry, we are overbooked right now, but we keep you informed. And so you signed up to their newsletter. So a very nice way of telling a relevant, funny story, putting something into context, making it look real, and um, reaching out to perhaps a new audience there. Another part which certainly is really the sign of time is everything is more visual. So rather than spending much words, you have info charts, you have little movies, authentic movies, you have pictures, you have animated GIFs, all this uh, leads to a really a better communication to net generation audiences because we are used or they are used to those um, storytelling through little chunks of information, little chunks of storytelling, and this can be very well done through visual rather than words. Another sign of time is everything, as we said, mobile, everything in the now. And certainly here um, is Twitter, a fantastic tool, and showing why Twitter is so successful and has changed so much. So if you are interested in all that, those topics, please watch those two movies, this one from um, 10 years ago which was actually trying to explain what Twitter is or should be. And you will find out that what they thought 10 years ago Twitter would be is very different from what it is today. And so this would be the movie that you can watch what it is to has developed in a totally new tool than originally thought it would be. I, because I guess too fast for non-net generation. It uses its own language, this language he talked about at the beginning, the short language. It's mobile, it's open source, new liberal. You can use it for whatever. You can mash it up with other apps. It's cross-media, it's push, not pull. So you don't um, get something in your uh, email which you don't want. You um, decide who you want to follow and you can unfollow whenever you want. It's kind of cult. What you see on the right side, the flying whale, comes only up if the server is, is down. And so normally what is a, a, a bad message, Twitter makes it a good message. So when the whale comes up, all the fans out there send to their friends uh, um, a Facebook uh, message or SMS saying, hey, go to the Twitter page, the whale is there. So people love it. It got celebrity support. Certainly Obama would not have been president use Twitter because that's how we could reach out to a younger audience. And um, it's still very active as a political tool. Um, 
thinking about uh, October Revolution, thinking about Paris, thinking about other um, um, aspects of big news which are spread through um, Twitter faster than any other um, company could do. I'm jumping here to a uh, slide. Um, sharing economy is certainly one of the big topics that uh, we will cover in a separate um, talk. Um, but it's obviously from this graphic that sharing is an extreme important force to come um, in whatever business you are. And there are companies that have been unknown before, which are now big in the news and big in the money, um, because they are champions of the sharing economy. And it's not only Airbnb, um, which are the big ones. There are more and more ones, and in different aspects of business, from accommodation, of traffic, to services, finance. And it will certainly find its way into other um, aspects of business. OK. So I would like to come to an end here. I will switch back as well to the movie. Um, and I hope I could reach you a little bit. Um, I saw I lost, I think, two people during my presentation from a top of 13 down to 11. So I hope they had just something else to do and I didn't bore you. And I think it's a very relevant um, topic. And I hope I could give you some aspects to think about. and. Um, just uh, go out there and uh, use those um, uh, digital channels, digi digital ways of doing things. And I hope, obviously, that you um, could get something out of these slides and download them. And as well, keep in contact with me. My LinkedIn is there in the slides at the end. So. I am very happy if you connect with me, perhaps just make a note that you're one of the ABMS students. And then especially let me know if you took one of those ideas um, and brought it to a bigger moment. I can tell you the boss of ABMS is a former student of mine. And so um, he learned very well about using his uh, new un uh, learned, um, how to say, uh, tools um, to uh, reach out and create a big, great school. So I would like to come to an end here and would like to thank you that you have been joining for me such a long time and um, hope to see you another time. If you come to Switzerland, let me know and we have some hot chocolate together. Okay, so wishing you all the best, thanking you and the school giving me the chance to be there. Goodbye.